Um, Jeff Ebel, nice to meet everybody. Uh, just real quick, show of hands, who's like heard a talk on this at one of their national conferences or been through this talk before? Okay, that helps me, thank you. So no disclosures, but if anybody wants to pay me to do something, I'm open to ideas. <laughs> um, so pretty much these are our uh, objectives today. Part of what I'm looking to do is about five, six years ago, they, we kind of started banging the drum of like sports specialization, huge injury risk, always wrong. You know, kids should be playing multiple sports, getting free play, which I don't necessarily disagree with those statements, but it doesn't necessarily correlate to the amount of injury that we potentially thought. So the literature is starting to really shift and the literature is really starting to make us look at individual sports. So that's trying, that's basically what I'm gonna try and cover today and the reasons behind why we're shifting that. So I'm not gonna do as much of the background stuff, but there's a ton of consensus statements out there from NADA, from AMSSM, from the American College of Sports Medicine. All of them kind of give their recommendations on when sports should be maybe taken down to a single sport to specialize to try and become elite. Um, they've all given their recommendations, but we're gonna kind of take a little different approach. And since we're not academia, at least most of us, I'm not, um, we're gonna try and basically apply it to our patients in everyday life out here. So that's my hope. So we've all seen the success stories. Um, I think that's why this is a topic and why people try to copy success. Um, you know, not only were these amazing athletes, they were amazing athletes from a young age. Um, and so when you look at this, uh, it's pretty easy to see why as a parent or as a kid or as a coach, you're like, yeah, I wanna, I wanna turn a kid into this. Um, problem is, is I'd make a huge argument that these are some of the most driven, motivated people you've ever seen in your life. And um, that's not for everybody. Um, even talented kids, that's not always for the most talented kid. So um, that's the first step of why this is even a topic. The other part is, is um, you know, as you'll see, money is a driver of everything in this world. The money in youth sports is out of control. Um, and so now it's becoming not so much an injury issue, but a development issue. So not just looking at musculoskeletal injuries to kids, you're looking at their social development, their mental health, all that stuff. And so to me, this is a topic um, that goes way beyond just injury. It's about development. Um, and I think that's what we want to keep it to. And then the other thing is, is kind of unrelated to this talk, but if you guys are in the peds world, uh, the studies on free play and just letting kids do their thing is amazing. And it shows injury risk reduction. It shows all sorts of things that you want to see to develop healthy kids. Um, and so when we're doing things that are limiting free play, that's also a red flag to me. So a um, little background just on sports in general. 45 million kids participate in the U.S., about 20 million of them estimated to be highly specialized. Sadly, we're seeing numbers of kids playing sports decreasing, um, which is not good, not only from a um, uh, healthy peds perspective, but for us, um, most studies show that the habits you develop as a kid, you carry on as an adult. And as we start looking at things like diabetes, obesity, all that stuff that weighs down our medical system is really hard on uh, providers, um, that unfortunately might be getting worse if we keep losing a good introductory and a good gateway through sports into physical activity and living an active life. Um, and then the part I probably like the least is um, the fact that we're seeing 70% of kids drop out of sports by age 13. A high percentage of that is females uh, compared to their male counterparts. And then in addition, this growing dichotomy, what that's referring to is of the kids still participating in sports, high majority of them are doing it in an unhealthy way. That's leading to overuse injuries, that's leading to joint issues. And then you're getting this other end of the extreme where we're not having kids meet activity guidelines. So 23% of American kids meet the five days a week, 60 minutes outside. That's really sad to me. Um, so when you see these two extremes, um, something that should be a healthy breeding ground for getting people active is kind of becoming a toxic environment. So where did the idea come from besides just seeing it in, you know, uh, like Kobe Bryant or seeing examples of it? 
There's actually some studies done on it. So Erickson and group is a big group. Um, I think he's kind of like the neuropsych side of things. He basically looks at what motivates people to become elite, and he kind of studied that. Really interesting, in the early 90s, he started doing studies on chess players and musicians, and basically found that when these people started working at their craft at a very young age and specializing, that they were becoming much more elite than their counterparts who started at an older age. And you know, in particular, he saw this 10-year, 10 10,000-hour 10, rule. And so he's saying if you apply their skill set for this many years, they should become and achieve this elite level by this time frame. So his thought was, well, if that's happening there, you know, can that be applied to sport? And other people kind of jumped on that idea of saying, hey, does this cross over into athletics? Um, the hard part about it is, is there's something that he kind of coined called deliberate practice up there at the top. And deliberate practice is like purposely doing things that aren't necessarily enjoyable at the time that you're doing them, but they lead to the development of a skill set. So particularly in chess players, he said they would set up scenarios particularly to look at how to attack this one area. And they'd work on that over and over and over all the scenarios. So that deliberate practice is kind of where that 10,000 hour rule came. Um, so when that sort of concept is applied to athletics, are we seeing more highly developed kids? Um, I mean, I don't think any of us can deny you see some kids these days that are pretty impressive physical specimens, and so you're seeing that played out, and I think people are taking that as success. Um, but in general, uh, you know, there's, there's some big asterisks with that behind the scenes when we're trying to apply this rule over to athletics from something like musicians and chess players. Um, yeah. So this is my slide that kind of boggles my mind. That's a 17 year old. <laughs> um, I mean, this is about to be Georgia's next phenom running back. And so you see things like this. I have no idea if this kid's any good, but just looking at him, he's going to look good doing it. So, <laughs> um, you know, that, those statistics, that sort of thing. Yeah. The other thing this reminds me is I thought I could play at a high level someday football. Yeah. No, I never had a chance. <laughs> Um, but, you know, this is what people see, and so then everybody says, hey, I can do that, and that's not necessarily true. Um, the other thing, too, um, is there's no research that substantiates if you start specializing in a sport from an early age that you achieve a higher level, and we're going to talk a lot about that. So sport specialization. Um, we still don't have a diet or basically a definition that's accepted. That's the big problem behind kind of the research right now and why a lot of our data and things are shifting because how we define this really matters. And so this is more from the academic side of them trying to be able to do big, you know, review analyses and all this stuff that gives us high quality data. Well, if you're using a different definition for what sports specialization is, that's going to extremely skew your data. So. This is the most recent one that was attempted. It's by Bell and Group. He's an athletic trainer out of Wisconsin who does a lot of research in this topic. And he tried to bring together 18, or he brought together 18 providers who are experts, quote unquote, in the field. He invited many more. Um, he set up what he called a Delphi study. Basically, they were going to bring together everybody, review the literature, and try and come up with an expert consensus opinion based on the literature and what everybody agreed in the room. So of the 18 who came, this is what they came upon participating more than eight months a year in a sport, um, basically focusing in on that sport or quitting other sports to try and make that your main sport, and then finally missing out on social interactions, school activities, extracurricular activities in order to focus in on that sport. So they landed on those three. Uh, this was only published in 2021. I've already seen like three rebuttal arguments saying that they don't agree with this definition. So. <laughs> We're not any closer to defining the problem, um, but that doesn't necessarily impact what we can tell families and kids. Um, another thing, this is a little bit older. I kind of like this spectrum look at things a little bit better than that definition that they just came up with because it kind of tells me who's actually trying to maybe pursue sports for not so much fun and enjoyment, but trying to get to an elite level. And as a provider, that's a red flag to me to kind of ask some more questions. So. Uh, choosing a main sport, participating greater than eight months of a year, and quitting other sports to focus on it. This is Myers scale. Uh, Jay Anthe is another doc. If you guys get interested in this topic, like he puts out a ton of research. Um, and he has a six questionnaire scale. 
Um, and what their goal is is to try and figure out who's a low specializer, a medium risk specializer, a high risk. So if you meet all three of these questions, you're high. If you only get one of the three, you're low. Um, and basically what they're trying to do is, is use that scale to put kids on a spectrum to know how much are they trying to specialize, how much of risk and injury things should we be looking for. In addition to this, the, one, the reason this takes a lot of scrutiny is because they don't have an age range, they don't have a cutoff, and so a lot of people kind of dismiss this definition. But between those, um, I think it's a really important thing that they'll hopefully figure out. So this study is just done in 2022 by Mosier and Group, and what he tried to show us is that a lot of our early statistics change dramatically based on how we define the problem. So it's a little bit of a busy slide, but um, over here, this first column, this is the percentage of kids based on their age that were a specializer if you just said, okay, they play one sport. So if you use that definition, which is what the majority of the original research said, if you just play one sport, you're a specializer. Well, I don't know many five-year-olds that are in like <laughs> five sports. So his whole point was, okay, yeah, 20% of those kids are specialized. But when you start saying, okay, then do they do year-round competition or greater than eight months? You know, one kid met the criteria of the 71. And then when he looked at the data even further and saying like, are they like doing other things, missing family events, you know, this is their life, you know, nobody met that. And you can see the percentage is extremely low for that definition until you get down here and we're getting about 40% of kids at the age of 15. Well, that's where the debate starts because is the problem with actually specializing in a sport or is it the age that they're doing it? So most experts would say younger than 12 is a problem. Between 12 to 15 is still very debatable and it doesn't necessarily show higher injury risk. And then most of them agree at some point in order to become collegiate one athlete, a professional uh, you know, Olympian, you do need to specialize. So is age 15 the appropriate time to be doing that? And if the majority of folks are starting to do that at age 15, it sounds like parents and coaches are kind of following the rules that we've set up for them. So I just, I like this study a lot because it made us pause and look at the statistics that we're throwing at families and really understanding, hey, is the problem in, you know, how we're defining it um, instead of with our actual parents and kids. So we have a lot of unanswered questions um, and that we're still working to understand in this area. Training volume versus a limited movement profile. So there's some really good studies, particularly in females, um, because their top three most popular sports are usually volleyball, tennis, and basketball. So out of Wisconsin, they put out a study that looked at female athletes playing this sports, and they looked at their training volumes and tried to put people in the same category for number of hours they put into their sport. So when you looked at the basketball athletes compared to the volleyball athletes, volleyball athletes I think had three or four times the injury rate compared to the basketball players. So is the problem the volume or is the problem you're playing a sport that does something repetitively hundreds of times a year so you're gonna put injuries into that joint. So I thought that was a really well done study to kind of show that certain movement sports may not be a problem at a high volume and we can't just blame it on that. The other thing too is movement diverse sports, it kind of piggybacks off that idea. Same question and same idea. Um, you'll see in our data later, there's a slide that shows 68% of soccer players specialize at a pretty young age. Well, it's a pretty movement diverse sport and it's a team sport. And so they aren't showing higher, necessarily higher rates of injury because of that training volume. And so when we start to look at these things, we've got to figure out does sports specialization and the injuries overuse stuff actually happen in movement diverse sports? Or is it things like tennis, volleyball, baseball, softball, where you're doing repetitive things that need to be basically closer watched or watched a little bit more closely? Also gender difference versus sport type. So uh, in the literature, no question, female athletes are showing much higher rates of overuse injuries and um, burnout and quitting sports at a younger age than their male colleagues. Is that truly a female male difference or 
is it because of the sport types that are popular? So two of the most popular female sports are very limited movement profiles, whereas males, basketball, football, baseball, really one of those, baseball, is a limited movement profile. So um, again, something we've got to kind of figure out as research goes on and watch closely. And then finally, I think the biggest question, the part that I talk a lot about with families when I see them is age to specialize. So we know younger than 12 is probably not healthy and probably not warranted and yeah, shouldn't be doing it. But what about that kid who's 13, who's a phenom, who's maybe ahead of the growth curve? Um, you know, should they be allowed to start specializing or is it at 15, is it at 18? Um, and so those are the questions we've got to kind of figure out. So why it's a problem? I think to all, all of us, it's pretty obvious, especially if you're in the PT world. You know, I got a kid who supposedly gained D1 scholarships at 14 in the clinic the other day and you have him do a single leg squat and he looks like Bambi. <laughs> you're going, my goodness, you have very poor neuromuscular control and you're telling me your knees hurt. Yeah, no wonder you can't control anything. So um, we're not developing kids to be well-rounded athletes. They're being very specialized and be good at their sport. And so that's, that's a problem to me and that's a huge injury risk. They're also not getting appropriate rests. I don't know how many kids play. Oh yeah, I play on this the team team, or I play on my high school team. I play on my travel team, and then I sometimes join a club team. Oh, is that it? Well, I also have my pitching coach, and then you just keep the list keeps going on. And then, well, doc, okay, you're telling me not to throw in games, but can I meet with my pitching coach? No, you have a stress <laughs> fracture. Like you're not throwing right now. So, kids need to get appropriate rest. These multiple team things is not good for their development. Um, and we need a break from sports. Um, burnout, you know, a lot of these kids, uh, they maybe only were exposed to one sport because it was popular in the region. They were getting to age 12, 13, and the statistics are showing they're quitting sports. So trying to create environments that lets kids sample sports, maybe they just aren't that great at volleyball, but they might be one heck of a, you know, a track athlete, or they might be one heck of a uh, basketball player, and they just never got the chance to play it. So encouraging kids to kind of look into multiple avenues. And then also the social aspect. I mean, it's really sad when you see how many kids are missing out on their school dance or their school activities, or they can't do this because they're traveling with their team. Um, yeah, you can develop team relationships, but what about uh, you know a kid who's trying to become an elite golfer? They're, they're by themselves 90% of the time and they're working with a coach and their dad or whoever. So um, I think paying attention to the mental health side of things is also important. So is it successful? Yeah, I mean, somebody like Trevor Lawrence, who was just touted to be the most highly uh, decorated um, pro prospect to ever come out. So his grade by all the scouts was the highest ever compared to you know Peyton Manning and all this stuff. And he's a kid from like age 10. He's done nothing but work with a throwing coach, quarterback skills, camps, all this stuff. So yeah, you see that and is it successful? Sure, for him it was but it comes with a huge asterisk and we'll kind of get to those points here. So, oh wait, sorry, I skipped one important part. So when we look at this, there's no research that substantiates getting to an elite level with specializing early. And actually 0.03% to 0.5% of athletes will reach the professional level. Same number of kids who can score a perfect SAT score. So when you're having that talk, are you going to score a perfect SAT score? And they're saying, I'm going pro. You know, you kind of say, even if you have Ubertown, even if you've got the genetics, still it's 0.5% that make it to the professional level. Um, and so a lot of these kids, if they were like me, probably would have been a lot better spent to spend a little more time studying for the SAT. You might have gotten a few more scholarships. But you look at that and you say, okay, we should really be refocusing parents to understand that specialization doesn't equal success. This is a slide I stole from Brian Hyland. He's a, uh, he was head of NCA research. It's kind of a rotating thing that the docs do. He was at AMSSM and he had this slide because they had just done a study and I thought it was a really well put slide. Um, it's out of Indianapolis. They basically they did a pool and did um, surveys to D1, Division II, and Division III athletes. And they got about 500 responses from each level. And the part I thought was cool is across this, so there's a little bit of difference in the bar graphs, but you'll see the majority of them are very much the same, and they weren't statistically significant in difference. So basically that's saying that all three of these bars are pretty much the same except for wrestling, 
showed that a lot of Division three kids never specialized. And then tennis, same thing, Division three kids didn't really specialize. However, these same rates of specialization for all these sports was equal. So if you're achieving the D3 level or you're achieving the D1 level and specialization isn't the difference, what is? 41% said they had a parent who played at the same level or higher. So I would argue genetics play a large role in that. Um, the other thing about that too is they kind of asked them, was it worth it? Would you do it again? So the Division Three kids said yes. The Division One kids said yes. The Division Two kids, majority of them said no. And a lot of them were thinking, well, that's probably because they didn't achieve the highest level if that was Division One, or they were starting to realize, hey, I'm not going to become a professional in this because I'm a Division Two athlete and look at all these Division One kids ahead of me or whatever. But um, so, like I said, I just thought that was a really well done slide, kind of showing you that specialization doesn't impact your future. And then these are just more statistics, kind of reiterating that point um, that, you know, 71% of D1 football players played multiple sports, uh, track multiple sports, you know, and then lacrosse, same thing. Only 12% of elite hockey players started before age 12, which to me is usually a big offender, but sounds like the majority of them weren't just focused in on hockey at a young age. So again, you're seeing that, that difference. The other thing is the IOC, the Olympic Committee, has put out uh, research, Germany, Sweden. There's some really interesting studies showing that when they polled most of their Olympic athletes, a lot of them didn't specialize in their Olympic specialty until age 18. And it was actually later than a lot of their national counterparts who didn't make the Olympic team. So they're saying that for some sports, specializing later may even be, you know, what's needed or necessary. Um, now there's always the caveat, gymnastics, rhythmic dancing, diving, um, you know, things where being skeletally immature creates an advantage and creates a skill set. Then, yeah, 81% of D1 gymnasts were specialized before age 12. So is that appropriate for that sport? Maybe. Um, is it the environment that they're currently in? Yeah, and I think to succeed in that environment, they're kind of forced to go down that path. But we, again, we've got to do research specific to each sport to know what's best for each sport. Um, and then we kind of already talked about that, but that 68% of elite level soccer players were specializing early. So do movement diverse sports you know, create problems by specializing early? Um, and then this goes back to my asterisk point. So this was an article, this was way back in 2018 even. I'm sure the statistics have only gotten worse, but $17 billion industry of youth sports now. Um, the average fees are 100 to $400, but most families, if they're really involved, will pay over 10 grand a year. Um, families making less than 25K a year usually only have a kid participating in one sport. Families making over 100K a year have uh, their kids playing in multiple sports, 45% of them. So you're starting to see that income is playing a factor into the opportunities that kids are getting. And that's the part that I really don't like because um, to me, you wanna let kids sample things. You wanna let kids play multiple sports. You know, when I was growing up, I thought 60 baseball games a summer was a lot, but playing three sports, I don't even know if I'd be allowed to do that now, which is kind of sad, you know, to play baseball and other things at the same time. So. Um, I really want to see kids have opportunities and, and figure out what's best for them. Um, and so that's, that's the part that I don't like. That's probably driving this more than anything. Um, so even though we have a lot of debate about what is truly accepted as appropriate um, as far as recommendations and statistics, and I'm telling you guys to kind of read that stuff carefully as we kind of fix how they define this problem. Um, these are level B recommendations, which is pretty good. Level A is our highest, level C and D is lowest, kind of depending on the scale. These went all the way down to level D based on how the study was done. Um, but these are recommendations from AOSOM, uh, AMSSM, ACSM. So these are things I talk a lot about with my families. And when I see them in the room, I wanna see a four week break. Yes, that's consecutive, four week break from your sport. I wanna see no more hours of a week than your age. So if you're 10, you're not going over 10 hours of organized sport. If you want, if the kid is very driven and they, you can tell that they love it, free play and doing pickup games in their sport 
is fine because free play is protective. It's organized sports, it's parent-driven, it's coach-driven sports that we want to limit to less than their age. Maximizes at 16 hours, so no matter their age, never gets beyond that. And then when they are taking a break, you know, this was more of a level C recommendation, the bottom one, but doing some integrative neuromuscular training, doing things that try and help change that um, and hopefully balance injury risk. So, like I said, age to specialize is really important depends on the sport, so things like figure skating, ice dance, gymnastics, we may need to do it younger. Um, but most studies would say probably 15 to 18 is gonna be the sweet spot to get to elite levels. And so letting families know that, that the age at which they decide to do this is important and having that discussion with them. And then the choice should always be driven by the athlete. So that's my big takeaway, is if you see a kid that just loves that sport, and you can tell they're the one driving and the parents like, yeah, we have another game this weekend. That's a, that to me, that's a much healthier environment than like these two gymnasts I saw the other week whose mom is way more excited than they are as I'm seeing them back for their third injury. And you can just tell like, here we go. We're gonna keep being drugged through this sport. Um, and so those are th kind of things you guys can be looking out for, seeing in your clinics, seeing in your offices, you know, kind of screening for that that dynamic of who's driving this. So what's a successful athlete? Uh, to me, I would argue it's somebody like Herschel Walker. I know he's kind of under some political stuff, so this was made before that, sorry. <laughs> um, that being said, to me, somebody who was at the top level of football, then the top level of MMA, he's always been an activist for athletic activities, came and talked at one of our national meetings. All he wants to see is kids staying active, being active. You know, to me, that's awesome because there's actually some really sta sad statistics of Division I athletes who go on to live very unhealthy lives and don't stay physically active. He's one of the few that is kind of trying to hopefully change that environment a little bit. So looking at it from a public health side of things, looking at it from healthy development side of things, not even really getting into the injury world and all the statistics, I think we can pass a lot of good information onto our parents and families about what is healthy and appropriate as kids are doing sports. So um, that's pretty much it. Those are my references. But yeah, let's get some questions if you guys got them. There has, I didn't peek too much at those studies particularly. So the question was like organized weightlifting, when to implement that, that age, that group. Um, but one of the talks I listened to, it's actually free on YouTube too. It's Dr. Jayanthi, he's one of the main guys. He had himself, um, his biostatistician or PhD statistician uh, talking about this. And then they also brought in a coach who's of sport performance. And the thing I liked from his takeaway point was he said grappling sports are a great way if somebody really wants to start their kid training early with like muscle development and tendon development put them in a grappling sport he said whether that's you know jujitsu wrestling whatever he's like have them do some of that stuff because it's body weight and it's learning to use your body uh, in space and so that was kind of i thought like really good recommendation for families who are really wanting to push that envelope other thoughts questions Uh huh. Sure. Yeah, at least. Yeah. So, like uh, that family with the gymnasts the other day, they looked at me like I had two heads. But yeah, <laughs> you say, yes, I want four weeks off consecutively, and you need to pick that time. And they'll, the, the kid will kind of panic if they're the one who loves the sport. But yeah, I mean, that's the sad reality is. They, they think that this is normal to play 12 months a year, and it's, it's not. Greater than eight months is too much overuse injury, and it's too much <laughs> on their joints. It's too much on their mental development. So, yeah. Yeah, so I'd say, you know, knowing good trainers, therapists in the area, um, kind of getting in contact with them. There's also... Um, quite a few development coaches now in that you'd be surprised um, 
that are starting to get out there now. Again, the hard part is, is you know, because it's people's time that they're sacrificing, some of those costs could add up pretty quickly. But I think the best way I do it, when I see huge red flags in my office, I'm almost always sending them to PT. Because I say, even though you don't have an injury, we're gonna do some prehab. We're gonna try and prevent some of these injuries and work on some of this stuff. So a lot of good therapists will look at single leg balance, they'll look at like Y hop tests, they'll look at different things that just say, oh yeah, like you've got huge glute weakness, we need to work on this. So yeah, if you, if you see that or if you have concerns, that's a, I think that's a, PT is a good bridge point for that if you don't have other resources. So they didn't see that in the soccer players was one of the more recent studies, that one where the 68% is pulled from. And so that's why they're starting to question it a little bit. But in general, the recommendation is at some point, if you're not giving the body a rest and taking a break from that sport, that it's probably unhealthy. Um, but yeah, there's a little bit of debate on that. That's why it's more of a level B recommendation instead of A, as they're saying there is some studies that are showing that, you know, some kids are making it through unscathed, but we're, they're still trying to figure out what's the appropriate time. But I'd say in general, you know, four weeks off is not asking a whole lot. <laughs> so. Overlap. Yeah, and I mean, that's hard. But to me, ideally, if they can get a little break, That'd be good. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would have been really mad as a kid if you told me I had to stop, you know, for that break. But I think kind of telling them at some point to back off the volume would probably be best. So like if they're involved in multiple teams, okay, at least at one point, you should maybe just be doing like one team of one sport so that you don't have so much demand because it goes back to that appropriate rest. Yeah. But yeah, those are, those are I mean, that's, that's where you just start the discussion. So that's good. All right. So how far does that take? Because kids that are not playing that sport, is that still the same with how they can run and not break and stuff? Yeah, that's where they get a little bit with that neuromuscular control. I think that's also where like a therapist, uh, they, you, you, you can kind of tell who's had a lot of volume on their body. And so them kind of giving them appropriate loads and volumes to work with is good. Uh, but it's pretty amazing at the, you know, the higher levels now they have full statisticians or people that are dedicated to that, that are just looking at, okay, this person's had this much training volume and load, so we're gonna put them in a deload week, or we're gonna do this, like, they are calculating that stuff nonstop now, so we don't have the resources to do it in the peds, which is probably where it's needed the most, but yeah, they're really starting to pay attention to that. I have not, yeah, I have not. Yeah. Yeah, nothing that I've seen specifically, but I also wasn't necessarily like looking for the weight training side as much in preparing for it, but yeah. yeah. Sure, yeah. Yeah, well, when you look at somebody like Zion Williamson, who's, his career so far has been pretty fraught with injury, and I would argue probably some of that's the load and the volume and the amount of stress he's been putting on his body with that size and weight at such a young age, yeah. Thank you.